Ça devrait marcher. Ça devrait partir. C'est pas encore. Je le vois pas encore sur mon écran, mais ça devrait aller. Voilà, N'oubliez pas d'éteindre le son. Oui, oui, bien sûr. Voilà, c'est parti. C'est parti. Ouais. Ah. Ok, super. Mais on attend encore 17h00. Oui. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Donc moi, j'éteins carrément le, euh, la page ici. Voilà. Donc, moi... On est enregistré déjà Oui, on, est, on, est, on, a, on vient de démarrer. Là. Alors parle-nous un peu d'Ascona, hein, pendant qu'on attend. <rire> Ascona. Oui, voilà, donc euh, euh, tu as vu que finalement on a réussi quand même à, à, <rire> à vivre dans, dans un Ascona virtuel. <rire> oui oui, on a quand même, comme je disais hier, on a tissu quelques relations avec, avec les, les responsables là-bas, hein, donc en particulier le, le, le professeur Herman, qui est directeur du centre, et, et puis sa collaboratrice, Madame Egli, hein, donc, qui, euh, qui a fait en sorte qu'il y ait une sorte, une sorte de continuité. Et donc, euh, en fait, ça a été annoncé un petit peu à la presse locale aussi. Euh, Yeah, there were articles in the local newspapers in TV. Yes. So yeah, there, there is some. We have participants from around the world and from Chichino. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, à part la compagnie et les, et les amis, c'est le, le train entre Domodo Sola et Locarno qui me manque. Ah. C'est ce petit train entre Domodo Sola oui, et Locarno. Oui. Mais ça, ça me manque. J'espère que dans l'avenir, ça va revenir. C'est fantastique. <laughs> Contre, il, y a, il y a des gens qui ont le micro. Euh, il y a un problème. C'est qui qui a un micro allumé euh, où il y, a, il y a de l'activité chez lui Non Je... ah, Voilà, c'est bon. Ok. Très bien. Voilà, donc ça aurait été le, le huitième, <rire> la huitième conférence d'Ascona. Oui. <rire> en fait, euh, voilà, on en a eu sept avec euh, sept euh, proceedings. Et euh, voilà, donc maintenant, qui sait <rire> On repart sur une nouvelle base peut-être, ou bien c'est le champ du signe, <rire> c'est difficile à dire. <rire> Mais bon, on a... Quelque chose de provisoire. Oui, oui. Enfin bon, en tout cas, euh, oui, c'est euh, bien d'avoir gardé, je pense, globalement, c est, c est, cette marque de fabrique d'une certaine manière. The spirit. Voilà, de spirit. Et d'ailleurs, euh, il y a beaucoup de, de, de participants qui, qui étaient à la première édition. Euh, donc, justement, il y a Étienne, hein, je me rappelle très bien. Il y avait Jean-Pierre, René, euh, il y avait Sergio. En fait, hier, j'ai fait une liste. Euh, Peut-être Martha aussi, David. Moi, okay, j'étais là aussi. Voilà, oui. Donc, euh, Moi, j'étais là. Oui, oui, toi aussi, bien sûr. Et donc, euh, en fait, on est pas mal <rire> de la première édition. Et comme je disais aussi, Sandra Cerrai était là. Ah ouais, je... oui, oui. On l'appelait Sandrine à l'époque parce qu'elle était toute jeune. <rire> J'ai des souvenirs absolument indélébiles oui. de cette conférence parce que Étienne m'avait reconduit à, de, à ce oui. à Marseille. Je me rappelle. Pendant cinq heures, j'ai eu la peur de ma vie. <rire> parce que la façon dont professeur Étienne Pardou conduit a de quoi effrayer. <rire> Qui. Mais enfin, bon, je te remercie pour m'avoir reconduit à Marseille en entier, en vie, mais <rire> tout le voyage, j'étais plutôt nerveux. <rire> Et on avait couru un ensemble je... aussi, tu te rappelles, René Ah oui, ouais, ouais, ça oui, ouais, c'était plutôt un embrassement pour moi. Mais enfin, bon, <rire> on partait du centre ensemble, puis après tu disparaissais dans les collines. Non, je faisais un peu le chien, disons, je veux dire, je faisais voilà, voilà. les retours. <rire> Oui, ça nous fait beaucoup de souvenirs, effectivement. Voilà. Cette année, on a quand même beaucoup de jeunes hein, quand même, qui sont inscrits. Voilà, donc je pense qu'on est presque prêts de commencer, Marta. Great. Uh, une, une question technique avant qu'on qu commence. Uh, je vais pouvoir uh, uh, 
partager mon, mon écran, c'est ça, de, de façon normale Oui. Il y a quelque chose de spécial à faire Ok. Bon. Hello, let's just start. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Very welcome to the roundtable on mathematical challenges raised by the COVID-19. Uh, since last March, the avalanche of information and daily debates on the evolution of the COVID-19 disease has strongly contributed to increasing public awareness of mathematics and in particular to show the importance of mathematical models, data science, and computational methods. This is what one finds outside the mathematical circles in the media, in journals, in many magazines. And uh, definitely, this is excellent news for mathematics, since the discipline is gaining a uh, presence in the daily life and appreciation. So that's very good news. Now uh, we go inside the mathematical community, uh, what is happening? Well, first, a terrific increase of research motivated by the outbreak of the COVID. Also, many requests to mathematicians to act as a help desk. I mean, with this uh, working in response mode, something not very usual in mathematics, at least uh, in the pure mathematical circles. Also witness the blooming of multidisciplinary teams where the mathematical science have a central role. And if you like to be up to date with the many ongoing joint efforts, uh, most of the websites of the largest mathematical societies provides a lot of information uh, on interesting initiatives, seminars, research programs hosted by research centers, departments, etc. For example, let's mention the Fields Institute in Toronto or the uh, Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge and many, many others. So in this landscape, this roundtable aims to contribute to voice the role of a stochastic mathematical modeling by the hand of three distinguished guests that I will now introduce. So uh, here in the middle of my screen is uh, René Carmona. Uh, he's the Paul White Professor of Engineering and Finance at Princeton University. He's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, SIA. He's expert in many topics, but uh, just to mention a few, stochastic analysis, mathematical physics, and financial mathematics. And together with Francois de la Rue, he's the recipient of the Duke Prize of this year, Duke Prize, awarded by the IMS to the two-volume monograph on the theory of mean field games that they developed over the last decade. René's contribution to the round table is on application of methods and tools used in economics, like contract theory and mean field games for decision making in the context of the pandemic. Our second speaker is uh, Jocelyn Garnier. He is an applied mathematician and professor at the Ecole Polytechnique in France. He is the laureate of the Felix Klein Prize 2008 of the European Mathematical Society. Uh, he has been junior member of the Institut Universitaire de France uh, for five years, and also uh, held the Schlumberger Chair of the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques for two academic years. And his research interests include models with waves and imaging in random and complex media, and uncertainty quantification. Jocelyn's contribution will be on quantification of uncertainties in the predictions given by the usual SEIR type models, trying to answer several questions such as what should be good strategies to collect data in order to minimize these uncertainties, and many others. And our last uh, panelist is uh, Professor Etienne Pardou. Uh, he is a professor emeritus at the University X Marseille and the laureate of the Montion Prize 1993 of the French Academy of Sciences. He is also expert in many uh, fields like stochastic partial differential equations, nonlinear filtering, backward stochastic differential equations, homogenization, 
And what is uh, very relevant to this round table, also on probabilistic models in evolutionary biology and pandemics. Etienne's contribution will address different type of model, models and focus on non-Markovian stochastic models and their statistical regularity, among other topics. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, the three panelists uh, um, for accepting to, uh, or invitation to be uh, here to participate in this uh, round table. So concerning the format, we will have the three presentations in a row, so 15 minutes each, uh, with a small break just for technical reasons, but not a real break. And uh, then uh, we will open the floor to uh, the discussion uh, to all the participants. So uh, I invite uh, René to share the screen with us. The first presentation of this uh, round table. Would you do that, uh, René? Share the screen. René? Yes. Uh, can, you, can you share the screen? Yes, but I would like to share the screen that I want to show, not uh, anything else. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's important, indeed. Okay. Okay, take your time. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. No. Do you see my screen? Not uh, yet. Not yet. Okay. Ah, now, it's coming. Now, now it's fine. Great. Now it's fine. <clears throat> okay. All right. That's fine. So I want to obviously thank the organizer whom I've known uh, for many years, but I have to admit that I would rather be uh, in Ascona than spending one more day stuck in my office at home. Um, and what I will try to... Uh, talk about is a way for mathematics to help to inform uh, a policy uh, decision maker uh, in a way that uh, could uh, uh, improve the understanding of the consequences of policies. Uh, we are in the middle in the US of uh, reopening the economy and uh, uh, we realize now there is a resurgence of uh, uh, the virus because presumably the economy was uh, reopened too quickly. Um, as an applied mathematician, I am very often criticized for uh, doing the following. Namely, an applied mathematician uh, developed tools, learned about tools, and tried to use these tools uh, to solve practical problems. But very often, uh, when a mathematician, an applied mathematician, has a tool, say a hammer, uh, each time he is presented with uh, a new application, a new challenge, a new problem, the first thing he or she does is pretend that uh, the problem is a nail and uses hammer uh, to hit the nail on the head. And this is exactly what I'm going to do today. In other words, uh, the uh, organizer asked me to talk about uh, COVID-19. Well, what I'm going to do is because I've been working for the last 10 years on mean field game, I'm going to pretend that uh, COVID is just a mean field game and I'm going to use my mean field game hammer uh, to hit this nail. Uh, However, uh, I will um, try to um, uh, talk about uh, the result of a couple of papers, but I'm going to warn you, uh, I am going to go through slides which are very technical with a lot of formula and definition, but I will try uh, to uh, discuss in words, in prose, like Mr. Jourdain, uh, what uh, the topic is about and not uh, get bogged down into the details, the gory details of the slides. So what I'm going to talk about is contract theory. Contract theory uh, is what the economists uh, develop to understand the interaction between two individuals, one who is called the principal uh, and one who is called the agent. And the principal is offering a contract to the uh, agent and the agent decides whether or not the contract is reasonable and whether or not it should work for uh, the principal. Uh, in doing so, the agent is going to optimize uh, his reward 
and solve uh, what we call a stochastic optimization problem. On the other side, the principal is going to try to design the contract to articulate the covenants of the uh, contract so that he will incentivize the agent to work for his own good, but at the same time serve the purposes of the principal. So the principal uh, will have to optimize, assuming that the agent is rational and optimize on his end the, or, or his own uh, reward. This is what uh, we call in game theory, a Stackelberg game. Namely, one of the players goes first. In our case, this is the principal showing the terms of the contract. And then the other players, given the condition uh, included in the contract, tries to optimize his own reward. But the principal, assuming that, will optimize the design of the contract. And you know, if they can find an equilibrium, um, that's what the, the economist has proposed the, proposing this theory would study. However, they added uh, a little twist, which they call moral hazard. And what this means is that uh, the principal uh, cannot look over the shoulder of the agent and, and check constantly what the agent is doing, how intense his work is. And on the other hand, the principal sees only the aggregate result of the work of the agent. What this means mathematically is that the standard way to study uh, optimization, optimal control problem, games uh, cannot be used in its strong form. We have to go to what we call the weak formulation, uh, which is based on the Martingale approach to diffusion processes. And as a result, uh, there are many more uh, technicality, mathematical technicality, which need to be addressed. But the idea is that one principal, one agent, and each of them is going to try to optimize um, his or her own uh, reward, and we hope for uh, an equilibrium. What I'm really interested uh, in this um, uh, short presentation is to look at one principal and one large number, one field of uh, agent. And uh, in this particular case, uh, in this type of model, uh, the principal still offers uh, a contract uh, to all the individual agent. And the agent, again, are going to look at uh, the term of the contract, and they're going to decide whether or not they should work for uh, the principal. And there are a lot of uh, instances uh, in real life, in insurance company, in, uh, in the financial industry. Uh, these are the example uh, coming to mind if you come from uh, the economic side and the financial economic side. But there are uh, in real life, many other applications where this situation is realistic. So we're going to try to move the standard uh, setup of one principal, one agent to one principal and a field of agent. But we could imagine the problem in two different ways. And I apologize for being very technical here, but I have to make this difference, is that once the principal chooses and announce the terms of the contract, the individual can decide to be selfish and optimize and compete with each other and optimize their own reward uh, irrespective of what the other ones are doing. So it could be completely chaos or if we reach a stable uh, setup, a stable situation, this stable situation would be a Nash equilibrium. That's what the Nash equilibrium is, a stable uh, uh, setup uh, in which everybody can optimize their own reward. So the principal will try to design the contract, optimize the design of the contract, assuming that uh, the individual will compete, but reach a Nash equilibrium. And computing this Nash equilibrium, the principal will be able, hopefully, to uh, design the contract optimally. But there is another possibility, which was uh, rarely uh, considered uh, uh, in, in at least uh, in, in, in game theory and in mean field game would be that once the principal uh, articulate the terms of the contract, the individual decides to cooperate. 
and basically, let's say they hire someone who is going to do the calculation for uh, the um, societal good, the good for the society, the common good. So the aggregate reward of all the individual find one strategy, one policy, one type of behavior, and all the individual agent would follow this strategy and behave in that particular way. And this gives rise to a new set of mathematical problem instead of assuming that the population would reach a Nash equilibrium, the principle will have to assume that the population um, uh, solves what we call the McKean Vlasov type of dynamic and optimize the McKean Vlasov um, cost because now the distribution of all uh, the states of the players and the reward that they accumulate will evolve with time. While this is not the case in the search for an Nash equilibrium where the distribution is fixed a priori. So we have these two types of problem. And uh, mathematically, we can write very long paper and try to solve these uh, uh, models um, theoretically, numerically. And what I want to uh, present is a simple application to a very simple model, uh, which uh, uh, we um, uh, put forth uh, to illustrate uh, the result uh, of, of a paper. And the editor of the journal Man Management Science we, we presented this, uh, this example three years ago. We had no clue about uh, uh, COVID. But uh, the, the editor told us, you know, could you relate that to uh, COVID? Uh, so, so this is why I felt uh, credible in speaking in this, uh, on, on, on this panel. So you can imagine uh, that the principal is uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of the state of New York, and that uh, the state of New York is uh, divided into counties for, this, for simplicity. I'm going to assume that there are two counties, New York City and the rest of the state, and that the individual can be uh, either uh, infected or um, uh, healthy. And I'm going to use the intuition of the classical SIR models of uh, the spread of a disease to design a, a rate at which the individual will become infected if they're in the city, would become uh, would recover if they are in the city, would become infected if they are uh, outside of the city or would recover. And also, I'm going to allow the individuals to move from the city to uh, the countryside or vice versa. And we can build in the model um, the fact that, for example, the healthcare in the city is better than in the rest of the state. And we can um, uh, use the intuition of this uh, SIR model to uh, formulate the rate of transition from one state to another, depending upon the proportion of people already infected or proportion of people uh, healthy. And this is why the mean field theory can be uh, used uh, in these models. And we can also uh, line up cost and reward for the, the governor, uh, you know, if he wants to be reelected or not. And we can solve uh, these models and obtain beautiful uh, plots. And what I want to emphasize in this plot, of course, I will not have the time uh, to go in detail and explain wh what these plots are, but at least I can um, uh, explain that we have two types of curves, the blue curves and the orange curve. The blue curve correspond to uh, the uh, governor really being active, writing um, uh, new legislation, and by executive order, in incentivizing uh, the people of the state of New York to behave in a certain way, put masks on, uh, social distance, etc. And on the other hand, uh, the uh, orange curves are the curves when the governor doesn't do anything and the individual selfishly try to optimize their own uh, reward and uh, reach a Nash equilibrium. So we can compute uh, all sorts of rates of infection. We can evaluate the uh, evolution of the um, population in uh, each state, city and non-city. We can also try to um, uh, uh, evaluate the rate at which people will want uh, to change from the countryside to the city. For example, if the city has a better health care, we would see here that the infected people outside uh, the city of New York will try very hard to move to the city. On the other hand, 
the infected people in the city will not try to uh, move out to the countryside because the healthcare is not as uh, uh, good. We can also um, see how the governor can um, fine tune some of the parameter to change the infection rate. This plot is very similar to the first one here, but if you look at the, infect the infection rate outside the city of New York, uh, here, the infection rate is controlled much faster. And you can also control the flow of the population. In one of the formulas for the cost to the, the governor, I had put a quantity which would penalize the governor if the population at the end of the period was different than the population at the beginning. And you see that here, if this term is not present, the population of the city of New York would increase uh, almost without control. Well, if this penalty term is present, the population will grow first and then uh, come back down almost to the level it, it started from. So I rushed, I apologize. Uh, 15 minutes is absolutely insane. It's not possible to present technical results uh, in such short amount of time. But what I want to emphasize is that with stochastic analysis tool, mostly from uh, game theory and mean field game, we can revisit some of these uh, SIR model and inform uh, the regulators, inform the decision maker about what consequences some policies uh, could have. And that's the hope that if we put this type of simple model on steroid and make it more realistic uh, with the, the right number of counties, the right number of uh, <clears throat> parameters and the, uh, calibrate the parameters to real situation, we could have something more uh, interesting and more realistic than these academic results that I introduced. Thank you very much. I apologize for being presumably out of time. I don't even know if I am, no. but. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, perfect. And uh, well, uh, I suppose that there will be uh, many questions on uh, your models uh, in the open discussion. So uh, you did a perfect job. So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we move to, to the next uh, panelist, uh, Jocelyne Garnier. Uh, so please, Jocelyne, can you share the screen with us? Yeah. I think I can do it. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, no, don't rush. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So what do you see? That's fine. Maybe you can put the full screen because uh, yes. we see we see one of the your uh, of your messages on the left hand side of my okay. screen. Okay, so now so, it's yeah, full now screen. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So, so thank you for inviting me to this panel. So indeed, I will talk about the modeling of the COVID-19 outbreak from the point of view of the uncertainty quantification, which is a domain in which I'm more familiar. In fact, I'm not at all an epidemiologist, but uh, mid-March, I was contacted to help uh, assessing the robustness of the epidemiologic uh, models. So that's uh, how I entered uh, into that field. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, models, mathematical models have been uh, proposed by epidemiologists to more predict the evolution of the uh, COVID uh, outbreak. And those predictions were in turn uh, used by policymakers uh, to make uh, quite important decisions. So uh, probably one of the first and most important example was a report uh, written by the Imperial College team, uh, led by uh, Nell Ferguson mid-March. So if you open this report, uh, you will see uh, this figure. And uh, that means that uh, based on the model that they developed, they predicted that uh, without lockdown, the number of deaths in Great Britain would reach about half a million and uh, two million in the US. So that report was uh, delivered to the British government. And based on that report, the British government decided to go to lockdown. Uh, so now we may wonder, uh, we may ask questions about the, let's say, the confidence, the reliability of those predictions. Because those predictions were obtained from models, well-known models, SIR type models. You may have seen one of them during the talk by uh, Marco Clandoli uh, two hours ago. These are very simple models. 
roughly speaking, sets of ordinary differential equations that describe the evolution of the population. Let's say uh, each equi the first equation gives the evolution of the proportion of the population that is healthy. The second equation gives the, uh, the governs the evolution of the proportion of the population that is infected, and so on and so on. You have different compartments, and for each compartment, you write an ordinary differential equation that describes how the, the proportion of this compartment evolves with time. So these are coupled ordinary differential equations. Of course, these uh, models are refined. Uh, there are some variants. Uh, you, you deal with uh, geographical uh, stratification, age stratification. So at the end of the day, you deal with, uh, again, sets of uh, more or less ordinary differential equations, but with a lot of free parameters that you have to uh, estimate, calibrate, based on the available data. So you can always calibrate those models by the square fitting, but uh, you may wonder whether your uh, predictions are reliable. And that's what I will talk about uh, today, that in fact, uh, it's not a big surprise, those predictions are very uncertain. So uh, once you make this uh, claim, uh, you have to discuss a little bit how to quantify these uncertainties and uh, hopefully uh, what, uh, what you can do to reduce these uncertainties. And uh, here, for instance, when I speak about uncertainties, on these particular uh, models, the uncertainty that you can quantify is not about a few tens of persons. Here, it's about a factor of 200. So you are really in a very uncertain context. So first, I will describe this uh, very standard and classical uh, SEIR model. So compared to the model that you have seen with uh, Marco Plandoli, there is one additional compartment. Let's say here you divide the global population into four compartments the so-called susceptible individuals, that is to say the healthy individuals that are susceptible to be sick. So uh, the proportion of susceptible individuals at time t is denoted by S of t. And then you have three other categories, three other compartments. The exposed individuals, those are the individuals that have been contaminated but are not yet infectious. You have the infected individuals, so those guys are infected and contagious. And eventually, you have the last category, the recovered people. And in that category, you put also the dead people, because from the uh, epidemiological point of view, uh, to be recovered or dead is the same. You are out of the picture. You don't participate anymore in the dynamic of the, of the, of the, of the outbreak. So here you can see the four ordinary differential equations that govern the uh, evolutions of the proportions of these four compartments. So you have seen them with uh, Marco. So the parametrization is a little bit different. Here I use parametrization that are used by the epidemiologists. Uh, Marco was using the ones that you can find in the... In sorry the, to say, interrupt the... you, it's Franco. Franco, not ah, Franco, uh, Marco. Sorry, sorry. Franco. sorry. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, uh, you, here I use uh, the, the parametrization that is, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is used by the by the epidemiologist. So here you have essentially on this very simple model without stratification in age and in uh, region, in geography, you have only three free parameters, the mean incubation time, TE, the mean infectious time, TI, and the basic reproduction number, the R0, which is, the, uh, as it is written, the average number of individuals which is infected by one person. So this is a very simple uh, model, as I said, and it's not so difficult to calibrate the three parameters given some uh, data, for instance, uh, the number of people that you observe that are, that are tested positive, stuff like that. But this is a very simple model, and you may ask uh, whether it is uh, reliable. So this model has been used, as I said, to make the predictions. So for instance, it was uh, used by the Imperial College team. Uh, here in the second version, uh, dated March uh, 30, you have many more details and uh, a little bit of uh, uncertainty assessment about the, the predictions that were given uh, two weeks before. But you can also find about the same, uh, same ideas in all the reports that have been written and used 
to, uh, to help uh, policymakers to decide whether you go to lockdown or not. And then I said, this, models, this model uh, is very simple, uh, but uh, it is based on very strong hypothesis. So there are, I would say, two types of very strong hypotheses. So the first type is about uh, the fact that these models come from microscopic stochastic models. And if you want to go properly from the microscopic stochastic models to those uh, deterministic macroscopic SEIR model, you have to make some assumptions, such as the uh, distribution of the incubation time or infection time uh, is exponential because you, you use a Markovian dynamics. So people know that, uh, that it is a strong assumption. And in fact, already, even in the first uh, report by Ferguson, uh, they propose some refined models uh, with arbitrary, more or less, uh, distribution functions for the incubation time and infectious time, which require to complexify a little bit the model. These are not simple ordinary differential equations. You have uh, integral differential equations. But at the end of the day, okay, the, the dynamics is not so much infect, uh, affected. I would say it's affected by a few tenths of percent, which is uh, uh, quite negligible compared to the second hypothesis, which is very strong, which is that within strata, let's say within a region or within an edge class, the population uh, is supposed to be homogeneous. In some sense, the particles, the individuals, sorry, are supposed to be exchangeable, so to, to have the same properties. And that's problematic because uh, when you do, uh, I don't know, neutronics or photonics or stuff like that, you may indeed assume such uh, homogeneity. But uh, when you do biology, it's a little bit uh, strong as an hypothesis. And there are at least two reasons why you may discuss this uh, homogeneity hypothesis. First, just biology. You may think, you may believe that some individuals are more vulnerable than other ones. So that's biology or genetics. And you may also invoke um, social reasons, which uh, is uh, some individuals may have uh, many more contacts than some other ones. And the two, for these two reasons, you may deal with uh, very heterogeneous populations. And then the predictions can be very different. So this is what I want to show uh, very simply. So I will not go into the few mathematical details. I will just consider a very a quite simple, say, I would say, a heterogeneous SEIR model in which I have two types of individuals. Uh, first type is more vulnerable than the second type. So then instead of having four compartments, I have eight compartments. Uh, susceptible of type 1, susceptible of type 2, and so on. And instead of having four ordinary differential equations, I have eight. But otherwise, it's again a heterogeneous SEIR model. So the only difference compared to the homogeneous one is this coefficient rj for j equal 1, 2, which is in, let's say, r1 and r2 measure the relative uh, vulnerability of type 1 versus type 2 individuals. So if I take R1 equal R2 equal, zero, equal 1, I get exactly the, the homogeneous SIR type model. But if I take R1, let's say, larger than R2, then uh, the individuals of type 1 will be more uh, vulnerable than uh, individuals from type 2. So here I assume that I have a fraction f of uh, the initial population that is of type 1, a fraction 1 minus f that is of type 2. I impose this balance equation. And I impose this because then the effective initial R0 of this uh, heterogeneous uh, model is exactly the R0. And as we will see, in the early steps of the uh, evolution of the outbreak, this model, this heterogeneous model, given that you impose this balance equation, will behave exactly as the homogeneous uh, SEIR type model. So let's see that. So here I will compare these two models, the homogeneous SEIR type model and the heterogeneous one. 
with uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, realistic numbers for uh, the year zero and the incubation in future time. Here I assume that I have 10% of uh, the initial population that is vulnerable, 90% that is resistant, and I take uh, a, a strong ratio. So it's just for the illustration. But as you can see, when I run the model, the two models, sorry, uh, the, so, the three solid lines are the, the evolution of the three uh, exposed infections and recovered co uh, co uh, compartments for the homogeneous model. And the dashed lines are for the prediction of the uh, heterogeneous ones. And as you can see, they, they give exactly the same predictions. You can hardly see the difference. And I had, in fact, to change a little bit uh, the initial condition so that you can see the difference here, that there are indeed uh, different lines there. That is to say, if you have some data, these two models will fit exactly the same data. If you have data that agree with the homogeneous model, the very same data will agree with the heterogeneous model. So uh, the choice of the two models depends on you. If your a priori information, if your a priori judgment is that, oh, the population you should be homogeneous, you will take the homogeneous model. And if you uh, believe that, on the contrary, the, the population is highly heterogeneous, we'll take the heterogeneous model. But this is just a priori judgment. This cannot be distinguished by the data. So is it? Serious, is it, uh, does it have an effect? You may say, but the predictions are equal, so I don't care. Yes, the predictions are equal up to day 30, where you have a little bit less than 1% of the population that is, uh, that is affected. But if you run the model over 100 days, uh, again, the solid lines are the prediction of the homogeneous uh, model, SIR TARC model, and then this is uh, the catastrophe. About 90% of the population at some point will, uh, will, uh, uh, will catch uh, the, the, the COVID outbreak. At the peak of the outbreak, about 15% of the population will be infected. So for the healthcare system, it's a nightmare. So this is typically the prediction that you find in the report uh, by uh, Nell Ferguson. But if you run the heterogeneous models, that is perfectly in agreement with the homogeneous one up to day 40, say, then you can see that the picture is completely different. The peak happens earlier, and the peak is much, much, much smaller. And in fact, at the end of the day, at the end of the 100 days, I would say, uh, less than 10% of the population will uh, catch the, the, the disease. Why? But you can understand here what happens here in this heterogeneous model. The vulnerable individuals are affected first. And once these 10% uh, of the population are infected, it remains only 90% of resistant individuals among each other. And uh, the outbreak is over. The game is over. It's, uh, nothing happens anymore. So this is a strong difference between the homogeneous model and the heterogeneous one. In the homogeneous model, uh, if you do a very simple calculation, you find that the herd immunity, that is to say the proportion of the population that should be immune uh, to uh, stop the, the outbreak is uh, 1 minus 1 over R0, that is to say here 70%. But with the heterogeneous model, with 10% of people affected, herd immunity has been uh, reached. So you, the, the, the outbreak is over. Again, I don't say that this is the truth. I just say that the two models have the same likelihood with respect to the data. It's all about your a priori judgment, whether you think that the population is homogeneous or heterogeneous. And also, these two models have the very same likelihood with respect to data, that is to say, the early data, the beginning of the outbreak. They give very, very different predictions. So just this very simple uh, example tells you that to make accurate predictions in epidemiology is really, really challenging. So in fact, uh, you can do something. Uh, here is uh, one slide to summarize what we have uh, developed. So as you can see, we uh, develop models with more categories. So I say the two uh, categories, vulnerable and resistant. As you can see here, you have four, but it's the same. 
but uh, the idea is more or less the same. You, 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 you will try to consider different uh, uh, type of uh, people, asymptomatic, here these are the asymptomatic people, given that you observe only data, mostly speaking, on this part, that is to say the people that go to hospital or intensive care units or who die. So to calibrate the model, you really have a hard time because you only have partial observations of the whole system. So if you want to really calibrate the system, you can do the first two steps, which are currently done by the epidemiologist. You calibrate the parameters of your fuel model by least square, that is to say by maximum likelihood. And once you have calibrated your parameters, you run the model with the calibrated parameters, with the estimated parameters to predict the evolution of the outbreak. So typically, people stop here after step two. But in fact, you have to quantify the uh, confidence of your prediction. So here, uh, without equations, this is what we propose. It's essentially Bayesian, uh, Bayesian analysis. So you don't run a fuel Bayesian analysis with a fuel set of parameters because that's uh, completely precise, a very high dimensional problem. So first you do a sensitivity analysis you, to determine the important parameters. The important parameters are the parameters that, uh, that are, uh, let's say, important for the output quantity of interest and that you cannot determine from the data. And uh, once you do the sensitivity analysis, uh, you fix the unimportant parameters to their maximum likelihood values. And you do a Bayesian uh, analysis, uh, analysis to estimate the a posteriori distribution of the important parameters. And you propagate the uncertainty of this a posteriori distribution of the important parameters into the prediction. So that's the, the mechanism that we have proposed to test many, many different epidemiological models and many, many uh, different ways to uh, interfere, to implement different uh, pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Okay, so I think that- So to that... conclude, uh, so there are a lot of uncertainties, essentially questions on the homogeneity of the population. So far with the available data that we do have, it's a piece of cake to fit uh, the, the models. So the models are very good to fit the data, but we are really bad to make predictions. So the question is, what should, you, should, what should we do to uh, reduce the uncertainties? We need more data, but not the type of data that we are collecting today. In fact, we have to look at the general population, the entire population. And one good way is to do surveys, surveys from random sample of the population. So we are currently doing that in uh, different regions of France to collect this data. But in fact, the first uh, time it was done properly was in Switzerland, in, uh, in Geneva. So in, the, in that paper, you have the first uh, uh, results from surveys from random circles of the population that give very interesting uh, information about, in particular, the behaviors of the uh, asymptomatic uh, people in the population. And I will stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jocelyn. So uh, it was a very nice talk. And now we switch to the last one. So uh, is uh, Etienne there? Yes, of course, I'm yes. here. <laughs> so. So, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's fine. So maybe you can you yes. can take the full screen yes. mode as, as you wish. Ah, now it okay. Has, it Is has that okay? No, it has disappeared in my screen. Mm. So maybe go back. Uh -huh. but I don't know how to go you back. know, Etienne, we have the same problem we had during the test. You should avoid the full screen. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. so then leave. Okay, I have the full screen. screen. You're right. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so I just yeah, put uh, it as yeah, that's, big. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but I can improve. It's uh, yeah, still better. Okay. So 
probably I cannot do better. If I try to do better, then I... <laughs> you will destroy everything. Okay. So That's very good. Big. Okay, good. So thanks for the organizers. So I'm going to to say uh, some words about mathematical models of epidemics and of course the application to the COVID-19. And this is joint work with Godong Pang from University of Pennsylvania and Raphael Forien from INRAE in Avignon. So I start with a classical SIR model. So we have a population distributed into three compartments, susceptible, infectious, recovered. And the bars here uh, stand for proportions. So the evolution of the proportions of susceptible, infectious, and recovered uh, follow the usual deterministic ODE model follows this, uh, uh, this system of ODEs. However, uh, if I consider, if I remultiply by the population size, the I equation, so that if I consider I as the number of infectious, then uh, di dt is lambda s bar of t i of t minus gamma i of t. So the idea is that each behind this equation is that each infectious meets others at rate lambda, which results in a new infection if the encountered individual is susceptible. And it is, and this, since we assume that uh, people are encountered, uh, when you encounter someone, you choose it at random uniformly in the population. The pro probability that this person is susceptible is just a proportion of susceptible in the population. So that explains the first term here. And now cons concerning the second term, as Jocelyn explained, uh, this is related to the fact that it is assumed that the uh, duration of the infectious period is a random variable with the, which follows the exponential gamma distribution. And this, ex, uh, this assumption is quite unrealistic. So if you assume that the distribution is an arbitrary, arbitrary distribution function, uh, distribution of the length of the infectious period is an arbitrary distribution function capital F of T, and you write capital F C of T to be one minus F, then this becomes, okay, I don't write anymore the equation for R, but this becomes the system of equation for S bar and, and, uh, and I bar. So here there is this F C zero of T. Uh, now, if you don't use exponential distribution, then you have to think that those initially, those individual who are, oh, I have written the equation for R bar. The, the people who are initially infectious, they have been infected in the past at, at negative time before zero. And uh, if you forget the exponential distribution, then certainly the, the length of time after time zero when you are still infectious will be different from, the, from F. So you have, another, you have another distribution function F zero here. Okay, so now, okay, this is, okay. So Jocelyn said that it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, improve very much the model. Well, we can discuss about that. Uh, it's, it's certainly a little more complicated than the usual ODE model. It's integral differential equation, Volterra type equation, but we will see later that thanks to this flexibility of choosing an arbitrary capital F, we can simplify, in fact, the model for COVID-19. Okay, but before we do that, let's say that something which is not satisfactory, this fixed value lambda is not satisfactory. So if you look at one page of the paper, a paper in Nature Medicine recently by these authors, you see that, okay, here time zero is the uh, onset, symptom onset. And so the individual was infected. Okay, maybe we can look at, at the left side. The, the, probably the individual was infected at time minus four or minus five, something like this. So he's, uh, exposed during a set, during a few days, and then starts to be infectious. But but you see that the, his infectiousness or infectivity varies over time. It's not a constant during the the time interval of uh, during which he's infectious. So the infectivity decreases after a maximum here. So for that reason. Let me propose an, another model, more general model, which is not 
I thought it was new, but in fact, I will say later, you can see it in a book with, which has appeared last year. Uh, so if you let lambda of t be a random function with non-negative values, so you take script e, so the duration of x post period, the first time when lambda is strictly positive, so between zero and script e, you are exposed, you are not infectious, and then capital E is the length of in the infectious period, so the first time that added to script E after which you are is the, the lambda is zero. So script E, is a, as I said, is exposed period, script I, the infectious period. So we assume that to each individual is attached a copy lambda I of T of this random function. And the various IIDs are, uh, the various lambda I's are IID. And to the initially infected individual are attached copies of another type of infectivity function, which is lambda zero j of t. Now we allow lambda to have a finite number of a given finite number of jumps and assume uniform continuity between jumps. Then we can establish a low large numbers as n goes to infinity of the corresponding individual-based stochastic model. So defines the total force of infection. So frac i n of t is the total force of infection. So it is the sum of the force of infection at time t of those individuals which were initially infected at time zero, plus the sum of all the force of infection of the currently infectious individual. So tau n i, so the process say, a, n of t counts the number of individuals which have been infected between time zero and time t, and the tau n i are the successive time of, in, of infection. So, so we have a result, a low large number result, which says that, so if s n of t, i n of t, i n of t denote respectively the number of susceptible infected and recovered individuals in the population, so the sum of those three is capital N, the size, total size of the population, which is fixed. And for each process Xn of t, we define X bar N of t to be N minus one uh, Xn of t. And then we have that the, the, those, those guys converge in probability locally and uniformly in t to this limit S bar frac i bar of t, i bar of t, r bar of t, as n goes to infinity. And if I denote lambda bar to be the expectation of lambda, lambda bar zero is the expectation of lambda zero, and f the distribution function of the random variable script e plus script i, then we have, we have uh, uh, this system of equations for, for our model. So you see, of course, we have one additional uh, uh, quantity, which is the total force of infection. But you see that this is, in fact, a, a SEIR model because, because lambda can be zero for a certain duration of time initially. So in fact, they are exposed. But you don't need to write an equation for the exposed individuals. In fact, here in this model, I, the I bar are the infected, which discounts both the exposed and the infectious. They are infected, but maybe not inf infectious. OK, we, we can write one more equation to distinguish between the exposed and infectious, of course. OK, now we now replace lambda of t by mu times lambda of t, where lambda of t is a varying infectivity of a given individual, and mu measures the intensity of his her social contacts. So we can assume that lambda of t is given to us by the medical science, while mu is essentially unknown. Mu is very much affected by measures like lockdown. I mean, it depends completely upon whether you, you, you stay home or not, etc. And it depends very much upon whether you live in a big town with a subway or you live in the countryside, etc. So now, now I want to, to study the early phase of the epidemic. So assume that we consider a phase during which S bar of t, the proportion of susceptible remains essentially equal to one. We can, we, can, we can assume that. Of course, we could in fact consider any phase during which S bar of t remains essentially constant for any C. But for simplicity, I, I take the case where, I take the early phase where essentially everything is susceptible. 
then now we, we, we remultiply by capital N, we consider numbers of, I mean, we consider numbers of infectious, uh, infected, I'm sorry, infected and, and recovered or removed. Uh, and now we, we consider the total force of infection. And we look for these, these guys as solution of those equations, which are the same as the original equations, but because I don't know in, in any epidemic, we don't know exactly when it started, how it started. So we start the equation from minus infinity. Now we look for a solution, which are because we expect such, we expect the solution to be uh, uh, of such linear system to grow exponentially. So, and now of course, rho is estimated from the data. It's of course very closely related to the doubling time, the no number of days needed to double the number of uh, deaths or the number of uh, uh, cases. And uh, uh, from if you, if you insert those quantities into the previous model, then we get these for mu and we get that yota is rho, uh, uh, bold i is this quantity, bold r is this quantity. And also we have the formula for r zero, which is this ratio. And you see that, oh, by the way, this, all this is all this except possibly for this here is correct both for rho positive and rho negative. Of course, for rho negative, this doesn't hold because r is always increasing. But in both cases, uh, you see that r zero is given by this identity. In fact, you can find this formula in the book by uh, which I will quote at the end, which appeared last year. And, and you see that if rho is positive, you get a R0 which is bigger than one. If rho is negative, you get an R0 which is less than one. And, and in the particular case, which is the first generalized model I considered where lambda of t is lambda times uh, indicator function of e, e plus i, then, then you have this formula for R0. Okay, and, and one remark is that if you neglect the exposed period, I mean, the exposed compartment, then you underestimate R zero, at least in phases where rho is positive. Okay, so now here is the, if you consider several different models, Markovian and non-Markovian, by the way, of course, I call Markovian models the usual model where the uh, duration of uh, uh, stay in each compartment follow an exponential distribution. Every, you all know that this is necessary for the model, the stochastic model to be Markov. And of course, in the non-Markovian case, then the limit is, uh, is an integral differential equation. So at each time the evolution depends on the past. Okay, so this is how R zero changes uh, uh, depending on the model with the same a duration of a mean duration of uh, in, infectious period, infectiousity period, and 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 these correspond to to the uh, our estimate uh, in France for uh, before before uh, before the lockdown and during lockdown. Okay, now let me look at the uh, uh, COVID epidemic model. So this is a Sairu model from uh, Liu Magal et, and co-authors, which is a little simpler, but sort of reminiscent of the model that Jocelyn showed us a minute ago. So susceptibles become exposed, the exposed become infectious, and then infectious very quickly either is uh, um, reported, becomes reported. Here, R does not mean removed or recovered by reported. And, and those are those are individuals who develop quickly uh, serious symptoms, and those who do not develop those, those who are asymptomatic, they, they are unreported. So it's a capital U, and then everybody at the end gets removed. Of course, a few are dead, but they are in this compartment, and and we can model this. Uh, you know, using, using our generalized uh, approach, we can model this, uh, we can simplify because we can put all the infections can be put just in I, but we have a bimodal distribution for the I period uh, because those who are reported, they stay uh, infectious during a short duration of time, while those who are, get unreported uh, stay infectious during uh, 
much longer duration of time. And thanks to the flexibility that uh, the law of I of the Z duration, duration of the stay in Z compartment is arbitrary, we can choose a bimodal distribution for that, uh, for that law. And that allows us to simplify, in fact, the, the, the classical model. We have less compartments. We consider less compartments. So more precisely, we choose for the length of the exposed period, uh, two plus two X one. Okay, the X's are a beta distribution on zero one. And, and Y is Bernoulli random variable. And the duration of I, so when y, I, when y equals one, you have two plus X two. So you have around three days uh, of uh, infectious infectious. You remain infectious during three days because after those three days, more or less three days, you get uh, you you go to the hospital and we are sort of uh, you 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 are no longer infectious because you don't meet anybody anymore. Hopefully, uh, and then the the others uh, who are unreported or asymptomatic, uh, their duration the duration is much longer here. And. Uh, of course, one of the problems is that we don't know exactly the law of Y. Uh, so therefore we, we make predictions depending upon the value of this probability between 0 0.2 and 0.8. Also another thing which we did not do so far, but we will do probably uh, very soon in a, a improvement of, the, of our work is to consider uh, the fact that the asymptomatic are less infectious. So take a lambda smaller for those guys and for those guys. However, uh, we don't have much information about, uh, about this. And that's a problem to have too many parameters with not much information. Okay, so now I've closed with a few pictures. Uh, this is the COVID epidemic in France during and after lockdown. So you see the, the decrease. Okay, so we, we have distinguished the, the Ile de France, which is a region around Paris, Grand Est and Eau de France, which is northeast of France, where there have been, for historical reasons, a lot of cases, and the rest of France, where there have been less cases. And, and you see the decrease, but you see that after the end of the lockdown, the decrease slowed down and the and, and situation get, may get worse and worse because the decrease, it's almost, uh, doesn't, almost no decrease anymore. And in fact, okay, some prediction, okay, prediction if you assume that rho after June 2nd is 0 0.02, which is not, which is compatible with our data, uh, then we see that there is an increase uh, in the, uh, okay, so these are number of days after lockdown. So today is 108. So we are here now. And, and, and you see that we may have an increase in the, in the daily hospital admission and hospital death, which up to the end of August, this is the end of August, uh, doesn't uh, mean much uh, uh, in terms of total death, but uh, it, if it would continue like this for many months, then it would be a very bad situation. And of more optimistic prediction, which still are compatible with our data uh, is that it continues to decrease. So I think I run out of time. The references, this is the references for our work with Goodall Pang and Raphael Forian. And this is a book I told you about where you can find some equations which we, for which we prove low large number limit. Uh, and, uh, and these are the, this is the model of Liu Magal, et cetera. And this is the, uh, uh, medical uh, literature that uh, we were using. Okay, thank you. So thank you, thank you very much for uh, your stimulating and interesting talks. So now uh, we will open the discussion to the audience, to the participants, but uh, now I pass the baton to Francesco who will take care of that. So <laughs> thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you very much, Marta, for uh, all uh, your presentation and uh, thank you very much to the three uh, panelists uh, who introduced, uh, I mean, several mathematical perspective and, uh, and point of view. 
so, uh, in fact, first of all, I would like to ask if there is a, a media question by the audience. Otherwise, we'd make some transition. Okay, so maybe uh, I'm waiting some uh, questions by the audience or my colleagues. Uh, since we are in a in a quite, in principle, larger audience, also we have a YouTube uh, connection. So I wanted to enlarge a little bit, maybe the discussion at the beginning, uh, asking a question to the, uh, which could be asked to the three panelists, in fact. So, um, in fact, the, there is a, uh, in mathematical models, you have always a debate about how many, how many parameters, how uh, should the, the model be complicated, that more precise, or should be more efficient, and uh, and uh, uh, yes, and uh, so there is a parameter which is uh, uh, everywhere. It's the R zero, which is almost uh, very popular, in fact, parameter. But uh, in I mean, in general, in in quantitative finance models, in general. Uh, people prefer models which are relatively light with not so many parameters. Now, the, uh, what, the, uh, in your opinion, what is the situation in epidemiology, in a, in a concrete epidemiology uh, with prediction and so on? I mean, I could, I mean, could ask to any one of you uh, this in order to start. Etienne, maybe if you can. Well, pro probably the most convincing argument about that was by Jocelyn, who showed that uh, uh, at least concerning the uh, homogeneity of the population, if you make it inhomogeneous in a certain way, then uh, then uh, uh, you change completely the the large time evolution, and uh, of course there is a lot there is a lot of literature on, on this. Uh, there has been okay. There has been a huge number of papers since the COVID uh, started, and uh, among those, uh, quite a few have considered the inhomogeneity both in age classes and also in uh, uh, activity, which is pro. I mean, so I don't know what Jocelyn calls. Uh, maybe he should speak. But what he calls, uh, I mean, his, social, his classes social was sort of mixture of the two. No. Yeah, we well, it's very, we don't believe that the biology is so different, but social networking is really really different among the individuals. You really have a strong heterogeneity on that level, so we strongly believe that in fact yes, the heterogeneity plays a role, but from the, the sociological aspect. But also by by the medical aspect, because if as you say, once you have once the, the those who are, have more chances to be hit are hit, then uh, most of the story is finished. Yes, no, that's, uh, that, but uh, that's known. I mean, we, everybody knows it, but it, it has to be underlined because otherwise, indeed, you know, this uh, story is that uh, really, we need to reach 70% uh, of people uh, uh, infected to reach uh, herd immunity is uh, completely crazy. Yes, absolutely. In fact, have you, there is a, a nice paper by uh, uh, Tom Britton, Frank Ball, and Peter Trotman, mm. uh, which discuss the herd immunity and shows that if you take into account the age classes and the uh, different uh, activity of the individual, it's, maybe it's not exactly the same perspective as, your, as mm. yours, but uh, rather similar, and then you decrease the herd immunity. Yeah. Doesn't get the, such an uh, enormous decrease as you got, but uh... no, no, I, I, I have, I've chosen, as you, as you have seen, I've yes. chosen a particular <laughs> example two categories uh, with a ratio 10 in vulnerability. That's a little bit too much, but it's just, it was just an illustration that. Uh... Yes. Thank you. Uh, so are there some, ah, yes, I see some uh, raised hands now. Uh, I would ask to uh, Rafael, who already asked, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, during the chat, in fact, a question. So it's a good moment to, to ask the question. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I can, uh, the, 
so first observation, and I wanted to see, you know, uh, I, it, it came to me when, when I was listening to Jocelyn, that uh, one of the major weakness of uh, Ferguson's uh, model approach was the fact that the number of undetected cases uh, that were actually, uh, so undetected essentially because they were asymptomatic, mm -hmm. were actually uh, transmitting uh, the, the disease. But people thought, okay, well, maybe we have, you know, uh, for, for one case detected, we have another case that's undetected. No, it's for one case detected, we have something like 20 or 40 cases that were undetected. So the proportion of detected cases was very, very low with respect to the reality. Mm -hmm. And that uh, could, you know, be the, the reason why we implicitly reached the, the herd immunity without noticing. Uh, for the current situation, there is another biological fact that I've been learned that I learned from uh, different uh, uh, friends who are biologists: is the fact that there is a balance between on the on the viruses between um, infectionness, so the, the 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 how how infectious they are, and their uh, their virulence. So the like Ebola, those who are extremely virulent are actually not transmittable as fast as those like a, a simple cold uh, who transmit enormously but are not very are just mild version mm -hmm. and so there is an evolution which is not exactly technically what we would call herd immunity mm -hmm. but uh, the fact that we have more and more cases but those cases are milder and milder and this is not an epidemiological uh, effect uh, like we are modeling in math mm -hmm. But this is more a biological effect. So, they, they, uh, so that makes the whole difficulty of these epidemiology models. Yeah. I loved really what uh, Jocelyn was saying on the uncertainty and the inhomogeneity of the population, because this is exactly the type of bias that we observe. But on top of that, we are on the very moving ground from the, from the terms of modeling. That is, it's not like we have a model and we are going to different phases of the model. The model itself evolved because there is some biological evolution. Yeah. Uh, there has been indeed some evolution of the biology, not so much. In fact, this virus is completely new. And I mean, it's one of the good points. It does not so much mutated. But indeed, we can see this effect. Unfortunately, in the last, I would say, 10 days, we have some bad news from the US where it seems that uh, uh, some young people uh, get seriously affected. They, 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 they get, but they are not so sick, actually. Okay. The, so the, the, the number of hospitalization yeah. is, is still limited. I, I'm here in New York. I'm okay, here. yeah. <laughs> Very closely. <laughs> <laughs> so we listen to the news, so we'll see. Okay. So maybe I can Lena. give uh, the floor to, there is Elena Isoglio, Dr. Elena Isoglio from Leeds. Uh, well, Hello. Hi, everyone. Oh, yes. Um, thank you for the for the talks. Um, my question is about super spreader and the role of super spreader. So it, it, in some sense, this is heterogeneity, but it's very specific to certain individuals. So can models take this into account? And would that make really a difference? So if there is one super spreader that spreads so specific events that lead the, the, the transmission or if you know, you can average it out and it's actually the same in terms of prediction. Because I heard that maybe all super spreader already got it in the first phase. So actually we're, we're much better off going forward, which I kind of don't believe, but it would be nice to hear. Um, yeah. Well, you may say this is a kind of heterogeneity I was talking about, but probably what you speak about is really the early steps of the, of the outbreak. In the early steps, the SER model is determined. It's not good. This deterministic macroscopic model is okay when there is uh, already uh, quite a lot of people uh, infected and uh, everything becomes more deterministic. In the early step, to know whether uh, and when the outbreak uh, starts, then the super spreader may play a very important role. After but that. Ah, okay, after that, it's yeah. averaged out. Sure. Yeah, it's a kind of averaging, yes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to. Can I? Can please, I? Add please, uh, please, uh, Rene. So, so what? Um, uh, what I am personally interested in is trying to model and understand the behavior of individual. <clears throat> now, it's true that uh, you know it looks like at least in the U.S. they're talking about a new trend on virus, who is uh, affecting different people and in a different way, namely. Uh, uh, younger people, but uh, uh, much more contagious and spreading much faster. So indeed, you know, we have to take into account that this model, uh, if we have any chance to uh, capture reality, will have to uh, change over time. But, uh, you know, beyond recalibrating the model uh, every week or every month, like we do in finance, you know, I would rather try to model the behavior of people, because I think one of the major problem uh, we had, uh, we have uh, in the U.S. is the fact that uh, some people follow the rules and others don't. So, uh, you know, maybe uh, by changing the model and uh, lowering the threshold over which you reach uh, uh, herd immunity, you, you can be hired by the Swedish government to justify uh, the policy. But, you know, what, what we see in the U.S. is that, uh, uh, you know, if you let the people behave and if they start behaving in a different way, and this is why uh, the age group uh, which are infected now uh, is very different is because the people that are infected now are the people who suddenly went out, went to bars, went to restaurants, went to beaches, went, uh, I don't know if there's concert, but uh, these people change completely uh, the dynamic and, and the, 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 the statistics that we see uh, just because uh, individual change completely uh, the model. Uh, and so, so I think, uh, you know, all these models uh, that we've been talking about in a sense, do not capture the fact that uh, uh, individual uh, and, and mostly the, the group behavior, the aggregate behavior change completely the problem. And, and, and I believe and I hope that we should be able to, uh, to, to capture that in some of this model and not having model which are basically um, set from the outside. And we try to calibrate because we're serious mathematician, uh, but you know, letting this model and the parameters and the coefficient be uh, derive endogenously by the behavior of the people instead of uh, uh, forcing it uh, from the outside and trying to make sure uh, that the numerical results uh, we have are uh, in sync with the, the actual uh, data. Thank you, René. So now, uh, in fact, there is a question of uh, Boalem Jaish, who is professor in Stockholm, uh, in Sweden, so a country uh, which has uh, been affected also by the virus. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we, we love soft uh, lockdown. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for, for, for the, uh, the, the panelists. Uh, I think the discussion was very, very uh, enlightening. I have two, two issues to raise. The first issue regard, is, regards the valid, how to validate a, a model. Uh, even with many parameters, probably one, one can uh, invoke this uh, artificial intelligence uh, capacity to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to train data and to estimate uh, zillions of parameters in, 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 in a good way. Uh, in all the talks I, I have heard regarding this uh, fitting uh, calibration issue, uh, there is a problem with the prediction power of the uh, parameters. So uh, is there any uh, good measure of prediction power uh, of the model, like a confidence interval? Even if you use uh, uh, Bayesian uh, setup uh, by choosing your, your posterior distribution and so forth. This is one, one thing. and. Uh, uh, in practice, uh, at least in, in, in Sweden or in Stockholm here, one observe, we observe the kind of uh, cluster behavior. Uh, this is basically what, what Rene mentioned now. So uh, different categories of people uh, uh, did, uh, uh, was infected and also spread the epidemics uh, with different uh, velocities. Uh, people that are in, in contact with like, like uh, doctors and, 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 and so many medics and so forth and people that are taking care of the elderly people and, and so forth. So, and this uh, uh, posed the question of uh, the dependence of R0 or R0, the, uh, the, uh, the famous uh, coefficient 
as uh, as a parameter that should be controlled by uh, different uh, uh, lockdown policies. Uh, so this is a nice uh, control theoretic problem, probably a game problem, uh, that that would give uh, uh, shed some light on on this behavior. Uh, uh, this homogeneity uh, uh, issue is is is. Uh, Yes, as is, is, is really a, a terrible uh, assumption in, in, in modeling, but probably uh, by looking, uh, by dividing the population into clusters uh, of importance, uh, uh, one, one could say something about the behavior of R0, or how to control R0 uh, with regard to policies. I, I would like to, I would love to, to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. So who is answering among the panelists. I mean, I can try to, uh, to add to what I just said, you know, because I'm, I'm preaching, uh, but I don't know if this is the right choir. But, uh, you know, if, if, if I look at what uh, uh, the state of New York is doing, so I'm in California, so I'm not uh, a fan of uh, the state of New York, but uh, the the, the, this is where the epidemics was the worst uh, in the United States. And this is the state which is doing the best now. Uh, and what, what is happening is that the governor basically has a certain number of knobs and measures every uh, single day uh, the value of a certain number of parameters. For example, the historical value of the R0, the famous R0, and accordingly reopen a certain county uh, to uh, the economy, uh, you know, reopen the bars, reopen the, the restaurant, reopen the beaches, or close them back down. And so it is really um, a, a control problem where uh, the, the, the regulator, the governor, can uh, turn the knobs by being informed regularly from uh, the, the data and, and trying to basically set a policy, uh, write down an executive order to try to uh, incentivize people to behave in a certain way. And so in a sense, in this way, uh, the state of New York is trying to control uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 growth of the disease. And, and, and this can be done by using all the models that we have been talking about. But, but there is uh, uh, um, a control aspect, namely you measure constantly and you use your historical data. Uh, and of course, the most recent, the better. And you try to affect the behavior of the people so they will social distance wear masks or you know if they don't want to do it then you close back down and so so that's i think uh is a component that uh you know if we want to wait for uh, uh, a vaccine or if we want to wait for a cure uh, this may be uh, the way uh, forward um i had a comment francesco um, a comment to, to René, you're mentioning this government of New York, governor of New York who can control uh, various buttons, but like a, a very simple control, you know, lockdown means uh, the maximum group size is essentially one, that is everybody stays at home or their family size, or you can have a maximum allowed group size of 100 or 1,000 or 50,000 in a football stadium. Is, is do, do any of the models tell the governor, you know, what limit on group gathering should I put now in order to keep the, the crisis under control somehow? I mean, is there any model that can give him that kind of information? Well, I hope that there will be people uh, looking at this and uh, crunch enough numbers so uh, that will be possible. But at this stage, <laughs> you know, that's from the fly of the pants. Uh, you know, the, uh, they try a few things and then they see. Uh, but but it, 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 it is the fact that, you know, they are on top of the situation by monitoring, monitoring and changing uh, the policy constantly uh, and, and, and appealing, appealing to people to behave uh, accordingly. And that's what I think is important is that, you know, people behave completely differently depending on uh, the uh, a directive, the, the guidance from, uh, from the regulator. And I believe this is why Texas, California, uh, Florida are in trouble now. California was doing extremely well uh, by locking down earlier than most other states. Uh, and suddenly California is not doing well at all. Uh, and while is, are these, uh, you know, the black 
Life Matters uh, demonstration or but I believe that's because you know people suddenly went to bars, went to a restaurant without uh, any uh, restriction, and and that's a, a change of behavior uh, uh, of the individual, change the behavior of the spread. Uh, but but for the moment, everything is empirical, and and uh, when politics uh, enter policy, uh, the problems become very serious because I believe that many governor, including the governor in California, basically cave and bend down because of the political pressure of, of, uh, of the people didn't want to wear masks and they were putting so much pressure. We had so many uh, 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 health responsible in the municipality who were threatened and who resigned uh, because they were ordering people to wear masks. People didn't want, and you know they basically threatened them. The people, these, uh, uh, Functionaire, where uh, their life was in danger, and they, so they quit. So you know, under this pressure, government reopened too quickly, uh, and 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 we see the result. But I think New York didn't do that, uh, and this is why they're in a much better situation. They're basically in the same situation as Europe, while the rest of the U.S. Uh, is in a dire strait now. So there is a, a question of Marco Isoppi who is waiting. Uh, Marco, are you there from Rome? Yes, Amir. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Francesco. So this question is mostly uh, for Jocelyn Garnier. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the uh, your short talk. It was really illuminating for me. So the question is about uh, inhomogeneity again, uh, which again most on everybody's mind. So um, replying to a question before you said the um, super spreader might be relevant in the very early stages but then uh, they do not because uh, you basically average them out. Uh, so I was wondering whether, I mean, this averaging is happening because the, um, we don't know who they are. Uh, so there's nothing else that we can do about average, but what if we knew? Uh, I'm asking this because, you know, we're putting now uh, in place um, contact tracing apps or uh, exposure notification, if you prefer, if you're not traced at the central level. So we might actually get knowledge uh, of who are the super spreaders, or at least the super spreaders themselves might be aware that they are super spreaders and therefore change their behavior. Uh, so if we know the super spreaders are, does it change your observation that the averaging uh, is the only thing to do? Um, no, no, I, I, I said, uh, um, if you do nothing, in fact, you get some evolution via some SEIR type model. But now, if you want to do some interventions, for sure, these are the, the kind of people on which you have to, to, uh, to do something because they will uh, reduce dramatically the, 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 the spreading and of the, of, the, of the outbreak. So uh, the super spreader uh, are the ones, uh, if they are known, on which we should pay particular attention. And we may know because these are the people who have a lot of contact, mostly. So we may try to do something. So this is what we try to organize. It's not so easy, but uh, at least it, we may have some effect. So indeed, th they are important because they, in the average, they play a big role in the average. <laughs> Thank you. I'm quite confident that I mean, these tracking apps may help us do that. Um, but indeed, uh, in the early step of the, uh, the outbreak, uh, stoch stochastic models are needed, and then the super spreader play a dramatic role. Yeah. Francesco, uh, I have... Uh, Marta, uh, yes. please. Yes, I have also a question on, on general models. So uh, I think that one of the most serious issues in the management of the pandemic is, uh, or has been, and is still being, to keep control on the occupation time of patients in hospitals. So my question is, uh, are there some models that can predict the degree of gravity of patients? So that means uh, to keep control of the length of the occupation time of uh, beds in the unit of intensive care. Uh, this is, uh, well, for the governments, I think that this is really a very serious issue. So I wonder if uh, 
what kind of uh, mathematical tools or what kind of models could uh, predict that? Do they, do they exist or not? Do you understand my question? Okay, I think so. I think that, for instance, Simon Cochmez and his team in uh, Institut Pasteur have uh, spent a lot of time and energy to try to uh, find out some models about indeed uh, the occupation time. It's it's really strange because they found out some bimodal distribution. Some people stay uh, very little, and some other ones stay very long. And it's not at all Gaussian or uh, <laughs> we have, uh, unimodal distribution. So they, they have spent a lot of time to try to understand what happens. But I have not worked directly on that uh, on that issue. I just know that they have worked on that. Simon Cochmez is a epidemiologist at Institut Pasteur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In fact, there is a st uh, still Raphael Duadi uh, who wants to make a, a comment uh, from risk data. Raphael Duadi, please. A very short comment. I mean, because there has been such a debate on the chloroquine. Uh, that uh, that that question very practically, very precisely, that question has been the object of huge debate and and very focused, etc. And that's very difficult because we are in an environment where there has been so much lies. Uh, so it's very difficult to to retrieve some reliable uh, scientific information because uh, basically uh, to make it bland, Gilead has been spreading the whole. Uh, industry with lies after lies after lies after lies, and so the 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 the, um, the, the, the whole scientific debate on exactly the question has been has been completely biased. It was completely impossible to get. Uh, there is a study that just uh, aside from Marseille, there is a study that just was issued uh, by uh, Detroit, uh, where very calmly uh, they also. Uh, studied you know the the impact and that's very interesting because it's a place where it's difficult to make bayesian statistics uh, the the biggest difficulty because people say want to say you know exactly like uh, Jocelyn was saying what is the distribution and you have multimodal distribution because you have different types of patients the the, the main driver is the age but then you have people who die fast so they stay short because they die fast you have people who stay long because they, 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 they take a long time and then people who get out because they get cured. And so you have a very multimodal distribution. And the question, the big question, which is causation between how you treat the people and the impact on, uh, on, on their health, so how long they stay, etc. Uh, this one is very difficult because you fall very easily into a selection bias. The, the, the joke that I give is uh, all the medication that people take uh, for heart disease actually are bad for the heart because they are having uh, heart attacks much more often than the others. But why do they have heart attacks more often? Because you give the, the medic heart medication to people who are subject to heart attack. So, of course, if you, you have a selection bias. And the same thing, you know, for the, the whole stuff about chloroquine, etc., was biased by the fact that it was very difficult to, to get uh, away from the bias of who do you give which treatment and who do you give that other treatment, et cetera. So that's why you, know, you, you get this very difficult uh, study of the impact of one particular uh, medication on uh, the, and in here of all the studies that I've seen, uh, the statistical studies are most of them are invalid, including Marseille, et cetera. And, but at least the good thing with Raoul and, uh, and Detroit, that they give you all the information. So you can try to deduce some causality, but the, the causality, you only deduce it by uh, um, really biological and medical observation and not statistical information. Statistics are almost irrelevant in most of the cases. You can have statistics say basically anything. Thank you. Um, someone from the panel would like to, to react. So uh, my only reaction would be that uh, it would be inappropriate to bash Marseille 
uh, in such a panel. <laughs> I hope that uh, Etienne and I would uh, fight. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 it, but, it, but it, but it is clear that uh, uh, you know the answer to uh, Marta's question uh, is in the hand of all these pharmaceutical company uh, trying, you know, having this clinical trial, trying uh, this uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, or other drugs uh, to see if they can shorten. Uh, the stay of the patient uh, in ICU. Uh, but I don't know that we have uh, uh, full access uh, to this data, and it may take times before uh, we will have access to this data. But indeed, uh, you know, that will be uh, uh, important to understand um, uh, from, from a regulator point of view, you know, mm -hmm. to find out how many hospital beds do we need. I think this is uh, important. But, but I don't think we have the data for that. I mean, I'm not an expert, and I'm not going to... Um, uh, say more, but uh, uh, the the pharmaceutical company have the data. We don't. So, um, and like uh, Rafael maybe, said, you know, there is a, there is a uh, strong bias. Another point Again. that is another point which is forgotten is the fact that I mean this is one point which has been raised by Raoult, Didier Raoult. Uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, chloroquine, but uh, the fact that. Uh, many people who have been, who have had the COVID-19 and after they recovered, they see that they have problems in the lung, you know? So, so it's, the problem is not only how many people die, how many recover, etc., but what is the long-term effect of this illness on, on those who have recovered? And this is not... I'm not sure it is well understood, and uh, apparently there is a there is unfortunately unfortunately a chance that that uh, uh, a good proportion of those people have serious problems later, and so that that should be taken into account in the also in the uh, in the policies. Okay, so um, uh, in fact. Uh, if uh, at the moment there are no uh, immediate questions, I would like to enlarge a little bit the, the discussion to, uh, to some historical points. So I am curious a little bit about, uh, to see uh, some uh, history of epidemiology. So in fact, uh, it, it, there was, a, it seems that uh, I learned, yes, for, from Etienne that read first model in 1929 was, almost the first one uh, to model uh, epidemiology. On the other end, uh, we have, in, in, during this century, we have the experience of the Spanish flu, then the Asian flu, uh, then uh, the Hong Kong flu, and some various SARS. And so there was an evolution in the, in the mathematical models. And uh, I would like to understand uh, if there were some interaction and which kind if those models were used for the historical uh, disease, in fact. Maybe Etienne uh, can help me on, on this uh, historical question. Well, concerning history, you have to go back to Daniel Bernoulli. Okay. Uh, he's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but there was an application of... Uh, yes, yes, that was uh, about... Uh, uh, okay, so no, he was... He was trying to convince his contemporaries that that you should the vaccination was was a good thing that there is that the, the 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 danger of not being vaccinated is higher than the danger from being vaccinated vaccination were existing at the time of Bernoulli? yes i mean that was a, a antivariolic uh, not not in the in the not the same type as today, but this was something that was imported from uh, Turkey I by uh, by someone. I mean, I think by the wife of the uh, yeah, British ambassador or something like this. The wife. Yeah, it was at least a century before Pasteur, no? Am I wrong? Yeah, it was quite some time before Pasteur. But sure. uh, okay, so uh, okay, and then and then also one very important guy in the history of. Uh, Mathematical models in epidemiology is in epidemics and epidemiology is uh, Ronald Ross. 
you know that in the that was more than 100 years ago it was in i think shortly before world war 1 so he was the first one to understand that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes okay in fact he studied malaria for the birds and the guy who uh, understood this for the humans is i don't remember the name but he was an italian <laughs> so <laughs> give credit to italians um and and one important thing is uh, uh for instance ronald ross he explained that if you want to stop malaria you just have to get the proportion i mean the ratio of number of mosquitoes uh, divided by number of humans in a certain location under a certain level. And that was hard to understand by his contemporaries because the, uh, the other medical doctors tended to say, well, as long as there will be uh, uh, mosquitoes who, who, who are ill, they, they will transmit the disease. But, uh, you know, you have to understand the idea of a dynamical system and stability of a dynamical system and the fact that uh, under a certain level the only attractor is zero and uh, and that Ross had understood but uh, it was it was hard to understand by uh, many people mm. so and this is one certainly epidemiology and epidemics modeling is one topic where I mean, ideas from mathematics are useful to understand what is going on, what you, what you have to do. Okay. I mean, Tom, this, this thing about uh, Ross is, uh, I think, is a good example. So Marco Isoppi from Rome, uh, yes, conf uh, tells that the Italian scientist is Marchia Fava, just uh, <laughs> for, uh, for completing your... Yes. So yeah, I just got a message. <laughs> <laughs> Max Angler has a question. So, but, uh, with a question, Max Angler. Max Angler, sorry, uh, I didn't see your hand. Please, Marc Olivier. Uh, uh, thank Please you up. for the discussion and the presentation. I would like to ask because we we learn we nowadays we we see that some 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 people some blends close the borders. They open the borders to or make quarantine and things like this. So in all the models that I have seen, as far as I well understood. Uh, the, the spatial dimension does not enter into the modeling. That is to say that one has a sort of ordinary differential equation only, but no spatial dimension. To your opinion, uh, would that be important to take into account? No, no, there are. In the most uh, epidemiological model, you have a stratification in regions and in countries. Mm. It's, uh, it's taken into account. It's... Uh... You have exchanges, and even at the local levels, I have seen papers in the US at the level of counties with exchange between the counties. So it's uh, the, ge the geographical aspect is taken yes. into account. So of course, you have many parameters. So again, yes. you are back to the yes. original problem. Well, you, you deal with uh, many parameter model, but it's a very high dimensional equation. Stratification in age and in region, everybody agrees that you have to take into account at least yes. that. Yeah. So, what, what is the importance of closing boundaries to, you know, uh, that, that was my, I mean, is it, how efficient that is? That's a question. I, well, I don't well not so much. It's efficient to, to, in some sense, the starting date yes. is uh, really dependent on uh, this kind of interaction. But now, uh, I think that by closing the border, you just delay the moment at which you are... Okay. Yeah, I see. Your outbreak will uh, take yeah. off, but uh, then uh, the way the dynamics does not depend on the exchange between the countries. Yeah. Well, well, you, you know, want to Iceland. A bit, but I mean, the, certainly the people in certain... Iceland and news. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, yes, yes, go yes. ahead. No, I was saying that uh, probably for I, I think that France was the last European country to to close uh, the to stop. Uh, air traffic exchange with China. And th that was probably a mistake, but... I yeah, mean, but the first one to close were, the, the, were Italy. Uh, In I'm Europe, sure. yes. That's they were the Italy. first one to close. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> they closed too late anyway. <laughs> no, I get yeah. that. Already back in January, 
I think the flights from, uh, because my, my father-in-law lives in Beijing. He had a, a plane ticket for the 5th of February and he could not fly. The, the Where, Beijing. to France? No, no, he was in Beijing. Yeah, to fly, fly to which, to, towards which country? He was in Beijing going to Paris. Mm -hmm. Paris. Okay, yes, that was my question. And, yeah. and his flight, uh, the, the, the last flight left uh, Beijing, I think on the 29th of January. So it's very early, actually. And that was because of China, not because of France. Ah. And I, I flew myself from, uh, from uh, Hong Kong to, to, to New York on the 19th of, Jan of uh, January. And probably uh, right, after, right after the Chinese New Year, it was impossible. So, so to, it was to, very early on. It was to, very to, early on. To, to, to answer uh, sorry, Mark's question, opening. you know, we, we may we may want to look at uh, New Zealand and uh, and Iceland. You know they really closed the borders, and so that might be easier because uh, uh, of the geographic nature of an island. But uh, you know they uh, are at zero 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 case uh, day after day after day. Now how long how sustainable uh, is that? That's a different story. But uh, you know closing uh, uh, the border is something that has uh, some effect, and now. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the uh, the problem in the U.S., Florida didn't want to have people from New York uh, come and uh, take a, a house in Florida and spend time in Florida. And now this is uh, uh, the reverse. You know, in other words, the governor of uh, New York is preventing as much as he can. But, you know, this is difficult to enforce uh, people from a certain number of state to move uh, to New York. Uh, so, so you know, it, it, it is beyond the politics, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying the policy, I'm, I'm talking the politics, uh, you know, they, they, this has an effect, a demonstrable effect. But how sustainable is it uh, in the long term? That's a different story. Mm -hmm. No, but it has an effect if you are talking about exchange between countries where the situation of the epidemic is quite different. For instance, you took the, the case of New Zealand. Of course, if you have a country with no case, then as long as nobody will enter, then there will be no problem. You will have no problem, okay? Maybe you cannot leave all the... <laughs> How long can you live like that? It's not clear, but it's... <laughs> I, I, that's what I say, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. But, but once uh, when the epidemic has started uh, and it reached a certain level, I mean, the stopping air traffic, uh, whether it's, it's crucial is not so clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, uh, at least with countries at a similar stage. I, mean. I had a question for yes. Jocelyn Garnier. Um, so it was the question you mentioned towards the end of your talk, the importance of getting good data and designing good surveys. Yeah. And, um, and you mentioned that the first good data was collected, I think, in June 2020. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, surprised that... Uh, no, 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 the data were collected in April and May and uh, the paper was published uh, June, uh, blah, blah, blah. Ah, so they were That's already it. collecting data earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But by the time they analyzed it. Mm. Um, but I was wondering if, you know, if to do a survey, you need a lot of enough tests, for example. You need to be able to test... Not so many, it. a few thousands. We, we did the calculation, we did our math. What is the size of the correct size of a representative sample to collect good data? We know that uh, we have uh, two projects, in particular one in uh, the Grand Paris area with 8,000 uh, people uh, correctly selected and uh, good serological tests. I think we will collect some good data. But were there enough tests uh, available at that tests. time? Were there this, are, uh, serology, uh, this is serology, uh, serology, serology yes. for antibodies. Is, so this aspect uh, is a, a, uh, another aspect, no. Yeah. I see. Hmm. Yes, the, the, role, all, the role of serology in, in all those things uh, is not uh, completely clear to, I mean, to me and uh, to many other people, I think. The, Ah, Sergio has a question. Sergio uh, so, well, first of all, let's say that I was following the discussion and uh, and um, the panel, and I'm very impressed. Uh, the beautiful talks and um, what I'm just wondering 
um, connected also with Mark's question, is uh, there are such uh, statistical investigation in different countries. Uh, for instance, in Germany, they were doing statistics on the special focalized cases in our Rhine-Westfalen, so, uh, yeah. and then other places like in Berlin and in the south of Germany. Anyhow, and then there are in France, I learned from Jocelyn Garnier, uh, they are more on the statistical side, also, comp also asking people after they had uh, this, uh, coming from those affected region, regions, they ask uh, uh, many questions, how they behaved and how do they possibly transmit. So, but this is in different countries. Is there some kind of network connecting this? First question. The second is there were epidemic uh, crises. I mean, not pandemia, but also very strong, in, especially in the East, Eastern countries before, like uh, other forms of SARS and uh, many. Different. And of course, uh, this one is particularly bad, this understand. But anyhow, also there, there must be some material. So, is there some attempt? Of course, there is the health, uh, World Health Organization probably has something like this. But the insight we have gotten now, especially in the West, say, is impressive. So, maybe one should somehow join forces with other. Uh, insights gotten by counties which were affected before in the East, but also in South America, in Central America, like you, et cetera, China, of course, but all, and Korea and Japan. Yeah. Sorry. My naive questions, but. No, no, in fact, uh, uh, a few answers about uh, this. Uh surveys uh, with uh, random samples of the population. Uh, it has been uh, indeed uh, done in a few uh, places, uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, France. There was one attempt in the US in Santa Clara County, but the uh, sample was uh, bad. So we couldn't uh, really use it. And indeed, uh, we all follow some guidelines from the World Health Organization who has proposed a guideline about the type of serology, uh, the type of questionnaires that you ask at the same time as uh, the serological tests. So we are capable to exchange uh, at least a common, uh, uh, a common set of questions and uh, serological results. Then additionally, everybody does something uh, original, but at least with, there is a common uh, a common setting, and so we can exchange uh, information. So that's quite good. Now, if you think about uh, now past uh, outbreaks, SARS or MERS, this, they were very different. That's uh, probably why we got trapped uh, this time, because we were thinking, oh, that may be the same thing as uh, SARS and MERS. Unfortunately, it's completely different. And the main difference is about the asymptomatic uh, uh, people. Uh, for SARS and MERS, when people got uh, SARS get sick with these two type of uh, coronaviruses, they get really sick, and you detect them. It's very easy to remove them, and uh, so the, the control was quite easy. The main difference with this virus is that uh, nobody expected so many asymptomatic uh, people who are infectious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Jocelyn. Yeah. So um, I had uh, another question. Please, on comment. Um, very, you know, in every country or most countries, they're trying to implement some sort of contact tracing, sometimes using smartphones of one kind, you know, one system or another, um, and sometimes just more traditional phoning people that uh, an, a diseased person or an infected person has met. I mean, what, what do you think of the efficiency of these methods? I, I mean, I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, tra contact tracing via smartphone will be a significant contribution to keeping the epidemic down, or will it be not so useful somehow? So, with uh, Jocelyn? 
so far, I would say in Europe, it has not been very successful. <laughs> but uh, I think that in other countries with uh, more mandatory rules, I would say, <laughs> Uh, this uh, this turns out to be quite effective to 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 detect uh, small clusters and to stop them uh, very early. So let's say in China, in South Korea, it's uh, probably uh, more effective. But in Europe, so far uh, there are so many. Uh, uh, maybe a lot of people have downloaded uh, the app that uh, keep track of uh, your contacts. But at the end of the day, when you count the number of messages uh, that have been sent about, you have been in contact, in close contact with someone infected, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. Say. So, uh, yeah, I would say because that this is a not enough issue. people have adopted it. Etienne? Etienne? I think not enough people has ad have adopted this system. But... Uh, it was done in France, Stop COVID was downloaded uh, close to 2 million times. Mm -hmm. So you may have thought, oh, it's not so bad. But at the end of the day, I think the total number of messages is, I think it's uh, 40. So, so I would like to add the fact that, uh, you know, this is going to be... 40,000 uh, or 40 million, uh, 40. <laughs> <laughs> A, a tremendous invasion of privacy and yeah. and that would be difficult for people to accept that voluntarily yes. now it yes. may be done as uh, as we know uh, without the consent of the people but uh, the individual but uh, i think this will not uh, 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 be easy to implement if you need the cons the proactive uh, ness of, uh, of the people um the uh, other issue related to that is also uh, the issue of the vaccine. And many people there are, for a uh, uh, face-based reason, uh, people are against vaccine. And in, in the U.S., one of the issues is that even if the vaccine is developed, are people going to be willing to uh, take the vaccine? So that's another uh, behavioral issue that uh, we will have to uh, uh, consider. Now, um, I apologize. I would like to say just one thing. I'm going to have to leave. Uh, I have another Zoom meeting in a few minutes, uh, but yes. I would like to thank you know the organizer for first organizing this uh, and doing it uh, uh, so smoothly. I was pretty concerned uh, that uh, a panel on Zoom would be a little bit chaotic, but it went uh, extremely smoothly, and 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 all the people who uh, participated and uh, contributed to question. But I apologize; I'm very rude, but I I have to leave because I have to join uh, uh, another meeting now. So, yes, thank you, thank so you very much, Rene. So I think I think uh, yes, I think uh, since Rene is leaving and uh, also. Uh, we have only 54 participants. We are close to seven o'clock. I think it's a good point to to stop the the roundtable, which was uh, also very stimulating. Uh, I mean, yes, it's a really a beautiful surprise for us. And uh, so, uh, I would say now to, to conclude some uh, closing remarks. So that I would like to, in, in the name of organizers, to thank uh, all the speakers and all the participants also, the participants who really uh, made this conference possible. So we, we could have a very prestigious people, uh, they accepted to come and uh, prestigious among the speakers, among the panelists, but also among the participants who really took part to this. So, uh, uh, we are really uh, very glad that uh, that conference could uh, make uh, Ascona conference keep alive somehow. And uh, and so thank you very much to everybody. Uh, so I think uh, okay, we will you will get maybe probably some uh, letter from uh, Robert concerning uh, the question of possible proceedings. But this is another story. We will.